Buonasera. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Monday Night Travel with Rick Steves Europe. Tonight, we have the great pleasure of traveling to Italy's gorgeous Cinque Terre. And now I'd like to welcome our travel partner for the evening, Rick Steves. Hi, Rick. Hey, Ben. Buonasera. It's so nice to be uh, together with you and with about oh, 3,000 other families. So thank you all for joining us. This is a thrill to be able to share our love of travel, specifically travel in Europe with all of our friends from all over the place. And uh, today we're going to the Cinque Terre. And uh, you know, it's just, it's kind of cozy. I feel like I'm inviting you into my living room. Uh, it's, uh, you make yourself at home. Uh, the bathroom's just down the hall. The ping pong table's downstairs. Uh, if you want to smoke, you can go out of the deck. Uh, and we're just going to settle in. I hope you got your munchies and your, uh, your drinks. I've got mine. I'm going to introduce that to you in just a minute. But uh, we're going to be traveling together. And you know, in normal times, I spend 100 days a year in Europe. And the rest of the time, I'm here in just north of Seattle. But I'm just bopping all over the country, giving lectures. And I didn't realize until this year that I need that connection. I don't know about you, but it's important to be in touch with people. And for me, this is kind of therapy. I got to give a talk. So thank you for coming in and sharing Monday night travels with us. Of course, today is Martin Luther King Jr. Day, and it's a chance for us to remember the importance of the United States celebrating its diversity and working for a better nation where we're all given dignity and respect and equal opportunity. And um, I think it's great that we have a day where we can ponder that important challenge that we have as a country. I also think that it's kind of cool that the day after tomorrow, we're gonna do something that would be a wonderful way to help celebrate the whole notion of Martin Luther King Jr. And that is we're inaugurating our first black woman vice president, Kamala Harris. And that is a great celebration. The first, uh, first woman in 46 vice presidents. And uh, not only that, a black woman and a woman with South Asian or American Indian heritage. And uh, you know, when I travel around Europe, I, uh, I like to go to these churches all over Europe. And I see in the back the list of the, the priests and the pastors and so on that have been running that church for four or 500 years. It's an unbroken chain and it is men, 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 until the last one. And more often than not now, the last one is a woman. And it's Took us a while, but we're finally figuring that out. And, uh, you know, I was figuring out what kind of t-shirt am I going to wear today? And I just stumbled onto my t-shirt. That's my Cinque Terre t-shirt. I want to show it to you because it's got the stripes that indicate on the trails when you're hiking the Cinque Terre that this is the right way. And I think what we're about to inaugurate for our president and vice president is also the right way. So we can celebrate this new step in our great country. Now we're going to be traveling in the Cinque Terre. It's a region called Liguria in the far, well, it's on the northern coastline of Italy between Genoa and Pisa. And it's a lot of work when we're on the Cinque Terre. So I want to make sure I've got good food. And one thing I, I love is food from the region. So I've been it's sort of a tradition here in our Monday night travels, but we're getting together the dishes of the region when it makes sense. A big deal in the Cinque Terre is basil and pesto sauce. And you got pesto sauce. I got rigatoni here. In Italy, in, in the Cinque Terre, they actually have a, a pasta that is designed for the pesto. The pesto is garlic and olive oil and pine nuts and ba basil all ground together. We're going to see it in the show. But I don't have the trophy. That's the kind of um, pasta designed for the pesto. But I did some rigatoni. But that's a beautiful thing. I want to remind you, in Italy, it is pesto country. So we're going to have a lot of pesto. And it's also a chuge country. A chuge is the Italian word for anchovies. And if you grew up in the United States, you probably just said, hold the anchovies because they're shriveled up and they're salty and they're just dried. In Italy, they're not that way. They're very tasty. I've made some bruschetta here and we've got our garlic and our basil and we've got our anchovies. And I'll be munching on those tonight. And I hope you will too. And uh, I've also made uh, an insalata, a caprese, insalata caprese, a caprese salad. And um, this is with your, uh, of course, beautiful Italian tomatoes. I wish I had a ton of tomatoes, but I don't. And you got your basil and you got your cheese. Uh, the classic one is with the mozzarella. But if you happen to be allergic to cow's cheese, I find that the feta is just as good. You crumble some feta on there. You got balsamic, you got beautiful olive oil. Ah, it's just a beautiful treat. So we're going to have the, oh, and by the way, this is a reminder of Italy because you've got the red, white, and green of the Italian flag. In fact, the pizza, the margarita pizza, is made from these same ingredients, basil, cheese, 
and tomatoes, and it's called a margarita, who's the first queen of Italy, to celebrate the Italian flag, red, white, and green. Now, when I'm in the Cinque Terre, I can buy a jar of pesto sauce, local pesto sauce, and it's a wonderful souvenir, and I eat it even after I'm out of the Cinque Terre. It makes a lot of sense, and you can buy it here as well. When you travel, another wonderful souvenir is picking up some of the homemade olive oil from your favorite agriturismo. This is from one of our favorites, Creatole in Tuscany, and uh, it's a beautiful part of your Italian cuisine. Also, we're going to have wine. Of course, you have to have wine. Normally, I go for the red wine. I like red wine better, but in the Italian Riviera, it's white wine, so we have our white wine. Frankly, the Italian Riviera white wine is it's good in the Italian Riviera, but I wouldn't export it. I wouldn't choose it over other places. I like it there. But this is um, it's actually wine from Roberto Becchi's uh, family uh, vineyard, uh, Madonna Bella. And uh, it's Tuscan, and it's white, and it's delicious. We've got dessert. And when you have dessert in the Cinque Terre, a lot of times it's biscotti. That's these almond cookies. Biscotti is the Italian word for cookie, biscotti. And you've got your dessert wine your vin santo, and in, Ital in uh, Cinque Terre, it's called uh, Shakitra. And uh, you've got, this is a, a vin santo from the Cantucci winery, but the vin santo in the Cinque Terre, oh, I love it. It's, um, it's called Shakitra, and Shakitra, oh, I've been, this is the, this is a double header. So we're having the second, second game here. So I'm just uh, well into this. And um, the Shakitra, that means push and pull. They push a lot of grapes into it and they pull out just a little, it's like, it's like using raisins. I mean, they've got so many grapes there. I think it's 20 pounds of grapes makes one and a half liters. So three bottles from 20 pounds, 10 kilos of grapes. And what they do is they dunk their biscotti into their sweet dessert wine. Mm. I'm not necessarily a big time dunker, but when it comes to Chucky Trough, and biscotti, it's the only way. When I made the TV script, I wasn't thinking Monday night travel. And I didn't know I was gonna be eating things in the order that it shows in the TV show. So I'm gonna be eating my, my biscuits and my sweet wine before the rest of my dinner, but it's okay. It is so good. Okay, that is our introduction to the food. I wanted to do focaccia because focaccia is a big deal in the Italian Riviera. And all I could find was Indian naan. <laughs> and I thought, Maybe it looks like focaccia. No, it just doesn't work. So we're not going to have the focaccia, but we're going to see it in this show. So I want to thank you for joining us. And right now, we're going to go to the very most beautiful piece of the uh, Mediterranean coastline anywhere. And that is the Italian Riviera, the Cinque Terre. Here we go. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best of Europe. This time, we're rebuilding medieval terraces here on the most beautiful stretch of the Mediterranean coastline, Italy's Cinque Terre. The Cinque Terre is five little towns like this, beautifully isolated in the most seductive stretch of the Italian Riviera. For me, the best bits of Italy are traffic free. And in this unique mix of Italian culture and nature, there's not a fiat in sight. Remember that, there's not a fiat in sight. Fiat free Italy, that's what we're going for. My favorite, Italy's my favorite country, my favorite towns in Italy, they're mostly fiat free. The Cinque Terre, these five villages, no cars. The beautiful towns along uh, Lake Como, up in the Lake District, north of Milano. Siena, Venice, of course. Even big cities, Florence, Rome, they've got traffic-free sections now. With our tour groups, we have our hotels right downtown. In Florence, we can no longer get our bus to our hotel. We still have that hotel, but we park the bus three blocks away in the big square and we walk in with our suitcases in order to be right downtown in the traffic-free area. When it comes to drivers coming into the, the Cinque Terre, what are you going to do with your car? 
technically you can get your car to these towns, but it is a headache. You don't want to mess with it. Trust me, it's not worth the trouble. Park in a garage or a pay lot in one of the big towns nearby and catch the train in. That's what we do with our tour buses. That's what we do when we're traveling individually. Celebrate Fiat Free Italy. We'll explore five rugged little port towns, ride a wine train high into the vineyards, make pesto in its birthplace, dive from spectacular cliffs, buy flowers from a singing florist, and hike, soaking up more sun and scenery than you can imagine. In the south of Europe is Italy, and between Florence and Genoa lies the Cinque Terre, We'll see all five towns, starting in Vernazza. Then we hike to Cornelia, Monarola, and Rio Maggiore, before catching the boat to Monterosso al Mare. So for 40 years, we've been taking our tour groups to the Cinque Terre, for 40 years. And for 40 years, people have been confused. Which town is which? There's a very easy solution. Do the number system. One, two, three, four, five. It's called the five lands, Cinque Terre. All right. Number one, the big city, Monterosso al Mare. Number two, the most interesting town, Vernazza. Number three, Cornelia, the one that's up on the hill. Number four, Manarola. And number five, Rio Maggiore. So that's the trick. Also, when you think of these, what I call back doors, the back door is... I started my company writing a book called Europe Through the Back Door. It came out in 1980, and it celebrated my favorite discoveries. This was one of them. Back doors are places where you catch Europe by surprise, candid, where you go and you're part of the party rather than part of the economy. The Cinque Terre is a back door. Uh, the nice thing about a back door is it needs to be kind of exotic and kind of special, but also easily accessible. There's lots of places this remote that are hard to get to, but this is just one hour from Pisa, two or three hours from Florence. It's very accessible and it's a back door. The Cinque Terre, which means five lands, was originally described in medieval times as the five castles. Tiny communities like this grew up in the protective shadows of their castles. Their people ready to run for refuge at the first hint of a Turkish pirate raid. As the threat of pirates faded, the communities grew with economies based on fish, olives, and grapes. Today, the big employer is tourism. Each rugged little town is a variation on the same theme, a well-whittled pastel jumble of homes filling its ravine. These days, the castles, which used to protect the towns from marauding pirates, guard only glorious views. This 10-kilometer stretch of the Italian Riviera is the rugged alternative to the more glitzy Riviera resorts nearby. The traffic-free charm is a happy result of its natural isolation. Just sun, sea, sand, well, pebbles, and people. For me, this is Italy at its most relaxed. For a home base, choose among the five villages. Each has a distinct personality, gently and steadily carving a good life out of the difficult terrain. You approach the Cinque Terre by train through long, dark tunnels. Explosions of Mediterranean brightness hint at the wonders to come. Milk-run trains tie the villages to each other and to the outside world. The first train line cutting through this tough, mountainous coastline was an engineering marvel for its day. It was carved out of these mountains just after the unification of Italy back in the 1870s. Built with the same determined spirit that united Italy, this train line literally helped tie together the newborn country's diverse regions. We start in Vernazza, where the big news is the hourly arrival of the train, bringing an almost rhythmic surge of visitors into town. There's one main street. It runs from its train station down to the sea. Of the five towns, Vernazza has the closest thing to a natural harbor. The old castle no longer says, stay away. Instead, it seems to welcome people-packed excursion boats. I want to just show you this, uh, yeah. These little excursion boats, it's a big industry. Cruising, giant boats with 3,000 people are docking just a few minutes away in La Spezia now, and they can inundate the Cinque Terre with their day trippers. And they sell a half day excursion to the Cinque Terre and they come in with these boats and they just blitz the place. In the middle of the day, it can be really crowded. In fact, the trails can be almost dangerously crowded. 
when I see these boats coming in, I, they, they roll out that gangplank off of the bow. And it's, it always reminds me of a syringe just coming in and mainlining tourism into these villages, injecting all that money from tourism that just is the lifeblood of the economy now. And it's necessary for the towns. This is their livelihood. They no longer work the fields, they work the tourists. Excursion boats settle into a comfy spot on the breakwater. Study the arrangement man and nature have carved out here over the last 15 centuries. Crumpled hills come with topographical lines, a terraced green bouquet of cactus, grapevines, and olive trees blanketing the surrounding hills. Each town is honeycombed with a range of rooms, apartments, and small hotels. Rentable private rooms, called camere, are the best values throughout the Cinque Terre. This gang rented a place with a homey living room and a small but fully equipped kitchen. This couple chose a perch right above the piazza. The adjacent church bells chime through the day, but thanks to an agreeable town priest, they're silent through the night. In Vernazza, the action's at the harbor, where you'll find a kid's beach, plenty of sunning rocks, and a wealth of cafes and restaurants. Like a breakwater keeps out the waves at the bottom of town, a gate stops traffic at the top. No cars enter this village of 600 residents, except early on Tuesdays, when trucks and vans roll in for the weekly tailgate party street market. While most tourists are still in their rooms, villagers, some who have never set foot in a modern mall, do their shopping. This is a good budget travel tip, or a good backdoor travel tip. Find towns that are so small they don't have daily markets, they don't have big stores. They've got um, weekly markets and uh, know when that market is and be there. In the Cinque Terre, each town has a different day of the week where the merchants will go and sell their fruits and vegetables. I can think of many wonderful towns, towns I just love in Italy and France and Spain and Portugal that are that small. And these are kind of places that we like to promote, we like to visit, with our guidebooks, on our individual travelers, and with our organized group travel. Remember, the local people know when their market day is. When you're making your reservations, check on the website, check, give them a call, check in the guidebooks, and be in the towns on their market days, and then be in the market checking it out because you're feeling the pulse of that community. When I think of the Cinque Terre, it's one of my first discoveries that I've really built my business upon. And it was one week back in the 70s, the late 70s, where I discovered Gimmelwald up in the Swiss Alps, which if you know my TV shows, you've seen a number of times, and the Italian Riviera. I found them both in the same week. I was up in Switzerland and I asked these schoolgirls that I met uh, who were studying in Florence, what was their favorite place in Italy? And they told me Cinque Terre. I'd never heard of it. Went down and checked it out. It occurs to me now that both Gimmelwald in the Alps and Bernazza in the Cinque Terre, the local people worked aggressively to manage the system so nobody developed in their town or in their valley. In the Swiss Alps, the locals had their land declared avalanche zone, so developers could not get a building permit. And here in the Cinque Terre, the local people conspired so that the federal government could not uh, build the, the, the freeway to have access to these towns. It kept them separated, but it helped them protect their heritage. These are the tricks that help the towns keep their heritages. They don't have big hotels for fancy tourism, but they have plenty of bed and breakfasts and little guest houses for you and for me. The mobile market serves a different town each day. The flower stand is a family affair. For 20 years of Tuesdays, the Lombardo family has set up right here. And the son, Eros, florist by day and opera singer by night, sells flowers with a dramatic flair. People of these towns are proud of their heritage. They brag that while big time Riviera resorts nearby sold out, the Cinque Terre is still locally owned. The families remain tight and they go back centuries. 
Until the coming of the train and tourism, these towns were very remote and heavily dependent upon the sea. Even today, traditions survive. While nothing like past generations, small-scale fishermen still earn their living working their nets while the tourists play. And each day, restaurateurs count on these men to keep their diners smacking their lips. And each of the five villages actually retains a distinct dialect. Every village has a different dialect. What's an example? An example for talk about married. In Vernazza is uh, sposato. Sposato. And if you're married in Rio Maggiore? Accompagnato. Very different. So when you hear somebody, you know what village they live in. Yes, sure. From the main street, you can pop into a series of narrow stepped lanes called Caruggi. These zigzag every which way. In the densest parts of town, these lanes become interior passages. If you keep climbing, eventually you'll pop out up at the top near the castle, handy for fleeing attacks. The castle is nicknamed Belforte, the place of loud screams for the warnings shouted from its tower back in pirating days. A tower has stood guard here for a thousand years. Visitors climb to the top for the view and to imagine past raids. Okay, I was hell-bent on including one of the kids jumping from a cliff into the water. It's what the kids do there. So we have our camera, we had the moment, and I went around town looking for a kid that would jump for us, and I found a kid that would love to jump for us. And then I saw where he was gonna jump from, and I thought, oh no, he's gonna kill himself. And I just thought, this is terrible. I don't want a kid to get hurt in order to make our TV show more interesting. But he jumped, he knew what he was doing, and we got a pretty good shot. Today, the castle functions as a tourist lookout, a perch from which local daredevils dive, and a restaurant. And the fort's lowest deck is perfect for a romantic meal. This is a special table for me. I've, ever since I was a kid, I've been going to this table and having a nice glass of shaki tra sometimes with a very nice travel partner. And uh, I really wanted to find somebody who could be romantic at the table for us. So we had the light right, we had the table set, the camera crew was there, and my job is to run into town and find a couple that'll come up there and, and we'll buy them some wine and some cookies and they'll be romantic for us. I don't even know if these guys were a couple, but they played it very well. And they're having this glass of shaki tra. And this shaki tra, again, it's the dessert wine. It is twice as powerful as regular wine. 18% alcohol. And the tradition is you grab a nice spot with your favorite travel partner. Sun's going down. Spend a little money. You enjoy a nice, nice shaki tra. Shaki tra. Dessert wine in the Cinque Terre. For a sweet dessert wine, sip the local shaki tra. It's served with biscotti, ideal for dunking. Savor the view and the unforgettable setting. But this submarine strength door hints that the weather's not always so calm. Mammoth waves can slam into this wall, and as photos inside attest, winter storms can engulf the entire tower in waves. Life here is subject to the dictates of the weather, and the people of the Cinque Terre know the weather by the wind. Bellissima giornata. So we did a show on the Cinque Terre 20 years ago. And um, that was when TV images were four by three instead of wide, nine by 16. And that's when it was standard def instead of high def. So we had to make a new one for the Cinque Terre 20 years later. And I had a fun little game where I wanted to find some of the same guys who I had done some of these little, little uh, discussions 20 years ago and sent him down to do the same conversation again. The man that talked about the dialogues from the different dialects from village to village, uh, we did the same discussion 20 years ago for that show. And both of us are a little further along that moving sidewalk of life. And uh, here, this um, Gianni here, he's, uh, he's he was with our show 20 years ago. And ever since, every time I see him, we have a running joke because his punchline here is, if you know the wind, you don't need no weatherman. So here, he's going to He's going to sit down with me and, and tell me the, the line we've been practicing for so long. 
una bellissima giornata. It is nice. Yes, but I think that the weather will be changed. Yeah, why? Because we have uh, now a wind from Syria called Scirocco. Normally the, the sea is a little bit rough. Yeah. And then after Scirocco, we have a wind from Libya yeah. called Libecio. <coughs> and the storm come, coming from the sea. So from Libya, Libecio. Yes. From Syria, Scirocco. Scirocco. Bad news. Yes, yes. And normally we have after Libecio, the wind from the north called Tramontana. Tramontana. This wind uh, coming down from the north and cleaning the sky will be uh, again una bellissima giornata. Good for the tourists. <laughs> yes, for us. So if you know the wind... In Cinque Terre, if you know the wind, you don't need a weatherman. <laughs> you don't need no weatherman. By the way, the beach we're, we're sitting on here did not exist 20 years ago. That beach was created when they had their flood about a decade ago. And uh, this flood was horrific. I want to explain. Each town is built on a ravine. You know, in the Middle Ages, they would just uh, put their towns on the ravine and then uh, they would realize, you know, it's nice to have their water mills right there so they could, um, I think I've got the ravine right here, I'll show you. But the There's the ravine. And they had their water mills there. And uh, to this day, the people on one side have a nickname and a sort of a spirit and then the other side, they got another nickname and another spirit. And in Vernazza, it's the people in the shade and the people in the sun. And uh, they cheated after a while. They cheated nature by, by bricking over their river which is fine. You got now a pedestrian boulevard right down the main drag of the town. But when there's a flash flood, all of the terrain functions like a funnel and it shoves all that water right there and it overwhelms the drain that's under that road and it can be disaster for the town. Uh, you know, the Italians didn't keep their drain clean. It was, you know, logs and bicycles in there and so on. It got quickly backed up. A few cars were pushed into it and all of a sudden the flood overwhelms the city and where I'm standing, there was like six or eight feet of mud right there. And the town was uninhabitable for six months. Some people wondered if we'll ever inhabit, re-inhabit and bring back to life Vernazza. Vernazza and Monte Rosa, the two main towns, both were devastated by this flood. Uh, of course, they're back now and they're lively and they're vibrant, but they've lost their patina of age. Every town was um, ground floor, every building was gutted, every single building, all the, all the tables, all the chairs, all the mats, all the lights, everything now is new rather than old and it just doesn't feel quite the same. The vibrancy is there, but it's not quite the same. Other man was no help when a freak rainstorm hit the region in October 2011. Like many towns built in a ravine, Vernazza paved over the stream that once divided the town in order to build this people-friendly main drag. The city was buried in an angry torrent of mud, 10 feet deep, with the steep hillside serving as a giant funnel. The flash flood overwhelmed the tunnel containing the town's stream. While every street level business in town was destroyed, the townsfolk have rebuilt and are careful to keep their expanded drainage system ready for the next episode of violent weather. Vernazza has recovered and its main square has some of the region's finest restaurants. And we're settling down for the classic dishes of the region, pasta with pesto and anchovies. And my son Andy joined us. That's me and Simon. And um, Andy is across from me. And um, let's get a better shot of Andy there. Um, there we go. And Andy is a great traveler. He's one of our ace guides at Rick Steves Europe. Just wonderful tour guide. And Andy's written a book himself for millennials traveling. It's called City Hopping on a Budget, Andy Steves Europe. And this is the second edition, and Andy really knows the cities from a young traveler's point of view. I'm very proud of him for that. And I'm also proud that Andy knows whenever his dad's in town with the film crew, he can probably scam a good dinner or two well within his budget. And we're going to see him twice in this show. Next to me there is Simon Griffith. Simon is our producer. He's been with me every show I've ever made this century. And uh, Simon is just a treasure for our production company. I can't imagine doing these shows without him. And Simon's going to join us in two weeks for our How We Make Our Show show. And we'll be able to interview Simon and ask questions and uh, get to know who the, 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 the silent bearded man that's always filmed eating dinner with me is, actually. He is the producer. He makes this show what it is. And anchovies. Gnocchi col pesto. The pesto is a local sauce. It's come from Liguria, the region where we are now. When you come here, you must try pesto. 
basil, which loves this temperate Ligurian climate, awaits its fate in the mortar. Fresh garlic, sea salt, and toasted pine nuts get mashed into a fine paste first. Then the basil is added. Gradually, the chef works it all into a rich green sauce. Like so many Italian dishes, virgin olive oil is mixed in. The pesto is finished with freshly grated Parmesan cheese. And then it's poured over the pasta. Tonight, we're enjoying it on gnocchi. <laughs> the most typical main course here, fish. Achuge, or anchovies, are a regional specialty served the day they're caught. If you've always hated anchovies, the harsh, cured and salt American kind, try them here, fresh and cooked in a variety of ways. So there's a nice meal, and you can see the uh, sort of uh, conviviality there, and it's just a nice laid back way to finish off your day. Uh, it always comes with a bottle of wine, and you'll notice these are bottles of white wine in the Cinque Terre. And I wanted to visit a vintner. And uh, when we're doing a TV show, you know, we got, what do we have, six, usually six days for a half hour show that we're watching today. And it's a scramble, even when all goes well. And we had to grab the vintner and go up one of these monorail trains that are so fascinating. And we had to do it with the weather good. The weather was changing and it was gonna be monsoon time in an hour. We just, we can feel the, the, the heaviness in, in the atmosphere as we go up this train. And this wonderful vintner showed us his work and then we wrapped it up and the rain just came down, but we got the bit we needed for the show to show off the vineyards of the Cinque Terre in action. From each town stretches steep terraced hills. The ingenious monorail wine train called a trenino carries workers high above the villages where small family vineyards are tended with knowing care. The Cinque Terre takes great pride in its white wine. Traditional farming techniques are complemented with modern know-how as the delicate vines are prepped in anticipation of a hot growing season. Historically, each family has its own small vineyard. With the lure of the modern world, it's not easy to keep these labor-intensive traditions alive. But those who appreciate the heritage of their land seem determined to keep things going. These hillsides have been terraced for centuries. Someone, perhaps after drinking a bit too much of the local wine, calculated that the Cinque Terre has over 4,000 miles of dry stone walls. Built without mortar, they require regular maintenance. The dry stone masons of the Cinque Terre are famed for their skill at artfully building and preserving the trails and terraces. And the craft survives to this day with this is Giuliano. He's a great, great um, craftsman. And, uh, you know, the walls and the bridges of the Cinque Terre are so fundamental. It's the infrastructure of that region. And Giuliano runs a, a bed and breakfast, and it's beautifully stoneworked. And I know Giuliano because uh, he married a wonderful American woman. And uh, I noticed over the years, a lot of American women marry the Italian men in this region, but I haven't seen the opposite happening. I don't know what's going on there, but there's all sorts of chances when you're traveling to connect with the locals and meet people like Giuliano who are doing the work of their forefathers there today, just like they have for generations. Skilled artisans like Giuliano Basso. All five villages are connected by scenic trails, much enjoyed by visitors. From Vernazza, the trail leads dramatically along the coast and through the vineyards. One of the essential Cinque Terre experiences is to get out and hike. The trails are rough, but manageable. Sure, there are plenty of ups and downs, but with these views, it's well worth it. The village of Cornelia, perched on a ridge sparkles in the distance. Cornelia, the one town not on the water, feels more remote than its sisters. With the church overlooking its intimate main square, a couple of restaurants, and a handful of private rooms for rent, it has a relaxing vibe. I remember when we were shooting here, we had about half an hour before the bus was gonna leave the town and take us back down to the train station. 
Cornelia is the one up on the hilltop, so it's a long hike down to the train station with gear. At half an hour, I really wanted to meet a local in this town, which is famous for its wine, and just feel his joy of winemaking and see his humble little family um, winemaking gear in his basement. And uh, so our crew kind of goes, yeah, good luck finding somebody. But I just went down the street and so friendly, met a guy, I don't speak Italian much, but uh, could uh, explain what we're doing. And before we know it, we're in there drinking his wine and filming it. Check this out. It's just a few minutes before the bus came to give an extra dimension to our visit to Cornelia. Since Roman times, Cornelia has been noted for its winemaking. To this day, many families still make a little wine in their cellar. And if you manage to get invited in, you'll enjoy an education and, of course, a taste. And quanti litro qui? 54. 54 liters. That's a lot. Vino della Cinque Terre. No, vino della Cornelia. Cornelia, Cinque Terre. Yeah, that's better. <laughs> At the windy end of town is a Belvedere, a breathtaking lookout perched high above the sea. From here, you can scout the rest of your trek and see your next stop, Monarola. There's one main path, so you won't get lost. Trails can be congested, minimize crowds and heat by hiking early or late. As the area is a national park, you'll pay a nominal admission fee and enjoy better maintained trails and a more pristine countryside. Whether strolling through shady olive groves, enjoying wide open vistas, or pausing for a little sunbathing on your own private rock, the hike is a delight. Monarola is petite and picturesque. A tumble of buildings filling its ravine above a craggy port. The tiny harbor, with its modern breakwater, does double duty, serving both fishermen and fun seekers. Cliff diving for beginners is popular here. In the Cinque Terre, everyone enjoys great views, and that includes the dead. I'm joining my friend Monica on one of her visits to the cemetery perched high above her town. Ever since Napoleon, who crowned himself king of Italy in the early 1800s, declared cemeteries are health risks, people in these villages have buried their loved ones outside the towns. The result? Dramatically situated cemeteries high in the hills. With evocative photos and finely carved memorial reliefs, any are worth a visit. In cemeteries like these, some are buried in a graveyard, while most are in niches, called loculi. The sanctuary is quietly busy with locals remembering lost loved ones. When you come to the cemetery, it's like visiting your family. Yes, my family, my friend. I know everyone here. So do you have relatives here in this wall? Yes, here I have my grandparents. Alicari. Alicari. Armando. My, my grandfather and my grandmother. Each one is a little bit different. It has a personality. I exactly. Think. Everyone wants the people have something like before. And exactly. people are coming every, every, every month, every year? Every, no, every week. Every week. Every week. And it's not necessary to cry when you are here. You are happy because you are together with the people of your family, with your friend. Uh, Rina is the first uh, bed and breakfast in, uh, in Vernazza. Uh, she rent room for the first time to American people. Here is an American boy. Look at that, with his rolling suitcase. Exactly, exactly. And Rina is waiting in the main road for mm. someone to arrive. Here I have Massimo grandparents. This is they, your husband's grandparents. Exactly. They died both in one week. Within one week. One week. And here I have my cousin, yeah. Sauro. Oh. Uh, they the flood came and took exactly. him away. And they found oh. uh, Sauro in uh, France. In France. Oh, that is just a, for me, that's a beautiful, beautiful moment. And that was all impromptu. I mean, just to be with my friend, Monica. You know, um, when I go there, I just always, when I go to Vernazza, I check in with Monica. She runs a beautiful little restaurant at Castello, right under the castle. And um, I see her father's eyes in her eyes. And her father, Lorenzo, was running the restaurant, the family restaurant, before he passed away. And uh, when I first visited, I didn't have enough money to buy a bowl of pasta in a restaurant. It was just sandwiches. And Lorenzo saw me and he said, hey, you look tired. You must be hungry. Sit down. 
and he brought me a bowl of pasta and uh, he passed away, but he's still there in spirit. And now I'm friends with his daughter, but these are the kind of moments I just, I love to share. And I wrote this book uh, for the love of Europe and it's for the love of people like Lorenzo. I mean, here's a, a chapter called Lorenzo's View, Bernatza, Lorenzo's View. And I get to share the story of Lorenzo and his daughter and my 40 years of visiting this town. One thing I love about Italy, you get to know the makeup, the fabric, the design of the social weave of these towns. And I've been going to Bernat's enough where I know the different characters and you see them year after year. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, more than anywhere else in Europe even, I feel that in Italy and I just love it. And you can see all these characters that we have cameos in this show. They're all people that are part of the personality of the region. Everybody knows them. They're part of the terroir, the social terroir of the Cinque Terre. Manarola is connected to the next town by the Via del Amore, or Walkway of Love. It's the easiest stretch of the hike and a good place from which to savor your own private piece of Mediterranean coastline. Enjoying this stroll, it's easy to understand why so many artists and romantics are drawn to this region. The next town hides just around the corner. Rio Maggiore, while bigger than the towns we've seen so far, is another cozy collection of homes nestled in a valley. The tangle of pastel houses lean on each other as if someone stole their crutches. The colors of these villages are regulated by a commissioner of good taste from the community government. So that's an amazing thing. I mean, those pastels are not accidental. If you go into the city hall on the wall in the waiting room, you see a poster that has all the different pastels that are allowable for you to paint your house with in the Cinque Terre. So you have to check with the community before you can paint your place. And the result is something quite delightful. I want to remind you, you can watch these shows without all these pauses anytime. All of our shows are available anytime at ricksteves.com. There's uh, 60 or 70 hours of TV there, not to mention another 50 hours of lectures. It's a whole university of travel. It's all free and you're all welcome to it at ricksteves.com. I also want to remind you that in just a few minutes, we're going to have our question time and Ben's going to be fielding your questions. If you got any questions, put them in the little Q&A widget there and we'll try to get to them after the show. For those hiking the trails, an ideal snack is a slice of focaccia. Focaccia originates here in the region of Liguria. The baker stretches dough to fit the pan, roughs it up with finger holes, adds a few simple ingredients, perhaps tomatoes and olives, drizzles olive oil, and splashes it with salty water. Hot out of the oven, the focaccia comes in several varieties and is a local favorite for a quick snack to go. Grazie. Grazie. Ciao. Bye. While you can hike or ride the train between towns, you can also catch the boat. If the weather's calm, hourly boats link the Cinque Terre towns. After a hike, it's fun to survey what you've explored. There's Monarola and Cornelia safely on its hilltop. And from my boat, I can almost see our apartment in Vernazza. It used to be complicated to get from town to town if you weren't hiking. I mean, it takes a long time. You can probably, three hours, you can hike to all five towns if you kept moving, maybe four hours. Uh, but you can get between all five towns in 20 minutes by train, just a couple minutes apart, and bam, the tunnel blinks open into the next town. When I first was visiting, there were no local trains. So it was only the long distance trains that were stopping. And if a long distance train back then in Italy, it'd, be, it'd never be on time. So you couldn't tell, there was no schedule. Schedules were ridiculous. You just went to the train station and waited. Now you have local trains that are just punctual as can be. And they're going a couple of times an hour. So it's easy, it's cheap and easy to get from town to town by train. And you've got that boat service, which is wonderful. As long as there is not a chop, if it's windy, uh, the boats can't dock and you're, you're limited to the train. But the point is commuting from town to town in the Cinque Terre is easy. And that's one reason why when you go to the Cinque Terre, settle into one town, stay for three nights in one town and then use the trains or the boats to get from town to town. 
Last stop for this boat, the numero cinque of our Cinque Terre tour, is Monteroso al Mare. This is the most resorty town of the group, with cars, larger hotels, rentable umbrellas, and the best beach around. So this would be where we would keep our tour groups. It just, it's more practical. You've got a hotel that can have uh, room for 25 people and you got a good connection with the train to the town nearby where you're gonna have your bus or your car waiting for you. And it just makes sense. Um, but if I'm on my own and I want more of a, an adventure, I'll stay in Vernazza, but with a group or for a lot of people, they enjoy the more comfortable modern conveniences that come with the one sizable resort town of the Cinque Terre, this town. If you want the kind of beach scene that leaps to mind when you hear the word Riviera, you'll find it here. Warm water, colorful umbrellas, plenty of bodies soaking up that Mediterranean sun, and an inviting promenade. Complimenting Monterosso. So, it's dinner time. Andy shows up again. I didn't know Andy traveled with such a nice jacket, but Andy is an Italophile and he knows uh, he needs to get his act together when he's going out in the evening and so on. And Andy joined us for this, oh, my favorite dinner in the Cinque Terre, and at least if you're looking for a gourmet meal, this is Mickey's. And when I see the footage of Mickey's here, I'm reminded how many hardworking mom and pop entrepreneurial ventures are threatened by the COVID pandemic. In Europe and right in our communities here, I love my town because there's no chains here. It's just all little one-offs, just the hardworking creative adventures of mom and pop entrepreneurs. That's what I look for in Europe. That's what I fill my guidebooks with. And most of them will survive, but a lot of them will not. And it's tough to have a business like this restaurant or your favorite restaurant and wherever you live with no revenue and rent for a year and staff and so on. And will they be here when the um, sun rises again on European travel? We don't know. We can hope so, but we don't know. But Mickey's is the place to go for a gourmet meal, as you'll see in a moment. This happy beach scene is Restaurant Mickey. And my son, Andy, is joining us for the region's most elegant dining experience. While tourism has brought a new affluence here, even high-end places are still family-run. The father, Mickey, runs the kitchen with an impressive mix of artistry and precision. Meanwhile, the mother and daughter help wait tables and charm their guests. The man on the left there is named Matteo. And Matteo runs my, my, probably my favorite hotel in the town, and it's called Villa Steno. And his mother runs a wonderful hotel that is the associate hotel also, Hotel Pasquale. Um, and uh, we keep our groups in these hotels. But when I'm in town, I'm busy. If I'm not making a TV show, I'm updating my guidebook. And Matteo is actually kind of my bodyguard almost because everybody's trying to squirm their way into my guidebook. It's the best-selling guidebook uh, for the Cinque Terre. And it's good business if you get into the Rick Steves guidebook on Italy. And I do not want to be fooled or corrupted by anybody to get them into my guidebook. Lots of cronyism in Italy. Cronyismus is the word. And Matteo helps me to try to understand it and understand people are just accidentally stumbling onto me. Oh, here's my card. And everybody's trying to squirm into my guidebook. And it is a fun challenge to make sure that only the people who deserve to get into the Rick Steves Italy guidebook get into the Rick Steves Italy guidebook. And I'm thankful for Matteo. He's my man in the Cinque Terre. Mickey's pasta is cooked with a unique twist, capped with pizza dough and finished in a wood-fired oven. Sarah is bringing us the house specialties and making sure we know what we're eating. It's delicious. Buon appetito. <laughs> when our pasta arrives and the crust is broken, the steamy aroma heralds a taste treat to come. <laughs> and to cap a great meal, Chef Mickey drops by as we're enjoying our traditional shakitra and biscotti. Complimenti. Tutti delizioso. Ah, uh, tutti bene, complimenti, buon lavoro. Meeting the family that's running the place and enjoying the shaki tra. It's just quality experience. And of course, you've got your sweet wine and, and you've got your, your biscuits. You know, one of my favorite things when I'm doing my work is to work all day. Excuse me, Simon told me never to eat while I'm talking on camera work all day and there we go 
And um, I have my dinner after checking out all the restaurants. So it's 10 o'clock, I, I say, okay, good enough. And I sit down just before they're closing and I ask Mickey or whoever the chef is to bring me whatever they want me to eat. I eat that, then I walk home. It's after 11. I feel so good with a day of hard work that's so productive. And I see in front of every restaurant, the chef sitting there, having a cigarette, looking out at the Mediterranean, feeling just like me. It's been a great day. I found my niche. Europeans have found their niche and they do it with passion. That to me is the mark of a, of a, of a, of a life well lived when you find your niche and you do it with passion. And we connect with those people when we travel. From the beach resort half of Monterozzo, a tunnel leads under the castle and into the old town. Here, you'll find more restaurants, characteristic shops, and a world of colorful lanes. Sure, it's touristy, and virtually every storefront caters to visitors' needs. But there's a low-key ambience where you're reminded that we're all in this life together, so let's enjoy the moment. Okay, I gotta say, when I'm looking at this last bit of the show, this is what we celebrate for European living. What is it about Europe compared to the United States that's different? I think Europeans are more into the moment. They're more into conviviality. They're less, frankly, materialistic. We're in a very political season right now, and a lot of the discussion is socialistic or materialistic. People who are more aggressive and more capitalistic, they will be threatened by socialistic lifestyles. Europeans, they're in the moment. They're living, they're embracing the day. Uh, and I'd like you just to look at the next three minutes or so of this show and think, how do you measure well-being? In the United States, in our culture, well-being is preceded by the word material. It's hyphenated. What's your well-being? Oh, my material well-being? You know, but I'll vote for this guy. In Italy, it's different. In Europe, it's different. Ha, huh. if you can bring home an appreciation of that, you've brought home the best souvenir. Check this out. It's aperitivo time, and as everywhere in Italy right about now, families are out, kids and parents, children enlivening main squares. One tradition that thrives oblivious to all the tourism is that special time when people are out, socializing, enjoying the cool of the early evening. Oblivious to the tourism. Sure, there's lots of tourists blitzing in and out, but that's just that just fertilizes the soil, the local soil with all their money. These are people enjoying the moment. This is real. Back in Vernazza, I'm enjoying the passeggiata with Irene. Ciao, ciao, Maria. A stroll here, especially with a local friend who knows everyone in town, gives a good insight into this close-knit Italian community. <laughs> a community that I've been visiting since all of us were a lot younger. Very permittable. Let me scoot Ciao, Antonio. <laughs> There's my friend. Does this bench have her name on it? Uh, yes. This is your bench. Ha detto che ci sono i vostri nomi su questa panchina. Italy's Cinque Terre is an irresistible mix of nature, culture, and human activity. Well-worn locals, sunburned travelers, and inviting family-friendly piazzas. Sure, the place is now well-discovered, but I've never seen happier, more laid-back tourists. While the Cinque Terre now endures the storms of the modern world, the region's charms are as endearing as its people are resilient. And even today, when the church bells ring, the fishermen at sea and the grape pickers up in the hills look back at their village, and they know Italy is still Italy. Thanks for joining us. I'm Rick Steves. Until next time, keep on traveling. Ciao. If you know the wind. If you know the wind, the Cinque Terre, you don't need a weatherman. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no. That's perfect. No, it's great. All right, I'm wrong. I'm calling where the water tastes like wine. Stay drunk all the time. <laughs> you know, I was just looking at this uh, earlier today, and uh, and my snapping is so loud. 
And it occurred to me, maybe I'm showing my age because I'm singing a canned heat song from uh, the late 60s, but I'm snapping my fingers and it's right next to my microphone, which is buried under my shirt right about here. So the mic picks up the snapping more than it does even my voice. I'm going where the water tastes like wine. <laughs> Stay drunk all the time. <laughs> In Chipotere, you don't need a weatherman. <laughs> <laughs> You don't need the weatherman. In the Cinque Terre, you don't need the weatherman. All you need is a couple of days and a good traveler's spirit. I hope you've enjoyed that look at my favorite chunk of the Mediterranean coastline. And I hope that you can go there and um, remember, you want to do it the right way. Hike those trails and embrace the life as a temporary local. All right. Thanks so much for being with us on Monday Night Travels. And we'll go back to Ben now for some of your questions. Ben. All right, Rick. Thank you so much for that presentation uh, of, of Cinque Terre. Before we get to some excellent viewer questions, Rick, how about a word from our sponsor for the week? All right. Well, thank you very much. And this Monday Night Travel is brought to you by a fine little tour company called Rick Steves Europe. And we're a group of 100, you, me, and 98 others. And we are making it through this pandemic time. It's not a pretty picture for any travel company during the COVID pandemic, but we are committed to keeping our team together and we're committed to being here with our team intact and our infrastructure good and our content better than ever, our contacts in Europe ready to go so that when we travel again in Europe, our company, Rick Steves Europe will be the company to go to when it comes time to put your travel dreams into smooth and affordable reality. As I always like to remind people, 2019 was our best year ever. 30,000 people joined our tours, 1,200 different Rick Steves tours. This last year, 2020, we were ready for the best year ever. We were almost sold out by the time COVID hit. And then we had to give 24,000 people their money back. And we did it promptly because we know we're in this for the long haul. And most of the people who take our tours are actually return customers. And we want to honor the people that you know understand what a quality experience and ethical company we're going to be as far as tours go. We printed up this 2020 tour brochure and didn't get to sell any tours at all. But this explains the 40 different itineraries that we offer. And we've got the 2021 version of this. We're not printing it up this year, but it's on our website in a PDF. So you can download it or watch it very easily. And this will let you know all the fun we've got in store for 2021 as soon as it is safe and reliable enough to open the floodgates for our tours. We're not taking deposits yet, but we've made reservations for our buses, for our hotels, and we've lined up our guides. And we're hoping to be doing tours again this coming fall. Uh, and, and those who want to be the first to know about it and to have an, a sort of an inside track to the seats available, they're getting on our wait list right now. We got well over 10,000 people on our wait list. And if you're curious about that, you can go to ricksteves.com into the tour section and check that out. All right. Thanks for joining us. And hey, Ben, let's have some questions. All right, Rick. A very common question from Angela and others. Is there a recommended time of year to visit the Cinque Terre or a time that people just shouldn't go? Well, in the winter, the most of the good restaurants are closed. The bad restaurants, it seems, stay open because they need to make some more money. But uh, uh, it's just the metabolism is almost turned off in the winter. So I would stay away from the area in the winter. Uh, the spring and the fall, they're the best. In the summer, it's too hot and too crowded. You got to remember, Genoa is a massive city and everybody in Italy loves to go to the beaches and it's just an hour by train away. So a lot of people in Genoa, the big city, will inundate the Cinque Terre on the weekends. And in the summer, you've got all the cruise lines coming in and assume, assuming cruise business is going to be going post-COVID, uh, the daytime between 10 and 4 when the ships are in, that's tough also. Spend three nights two days, one day for sightseeing, one day just to relax, stay in one town and be up early and out and be out late in the evening. And that's when it's all yours and much more laid back, much cooler and without all the tour crowd, all the cruise boat crowds. Um, Heidi and others are wondering, in a trip to Italy, say 10 days, two weeks, something like this, would you prioritize uh, the Cinque Terre or the Amalfi Coast? Oh, no question, the Cinque Terre. The Amalfi Coast is more glitzy, more Sophia Loren hung out there. I mean, more movie stars hang out there and so on. But the, the Amalfi Coast is cliffs with resort elegant hotels and elevators that take you down to the beach. And such narrow roads and such huge traffic congestion, 
they only let people go in one direction one day and the other direction the other day, or, or even an odd license plate or whatever. They're always trying to figure out the traffic situation. Um, I like the Amalfi Coast, but it's nothing like the Cinque Terre. Um, and you know, when you're thinking about an itinerary, look at our itineraries. We've got, I think we've got five different um, Italy itineraries in this PDF at ricksteves.com. And even if you're not thinking about taking one of our tours, look at how we chart out the time because on the Best of Italy tour, you can see we have our time in the Cinque Terre. In the Best of Europe in 20 days, we get two nights, you know, 10% of the Best of Europe is the Cinque Terre. If you're gonna do Venice, Florence and Rome, you need a break. And my break would be the Cinque Terre. Um, Alexander asked if you think that small towns like these in the Cinque Terre will survive if uh, as the older generation leaves us, are there going to be enough young people sticking around to carry on the traditions? Well, not to carry on the traditions, the towns will survive, but now people will telecommute and people are doing high tech um, uh, employment from little villages that otherwise would not have that opportunity because they can telecommute. A lot of the um, uh, older people are moving to the big city where they're closer to medical service and they've got elevators and so on. It's tough to be a, a old person who can't climb stairs easily and live in the Cinque Terre. It's nothing. I don't think there's a single elevator in a lot of those towns. Um, what they do is they rent out their their apartments to people from Eastern Europe or people from big other places and they go to the big city and essentially retire and these people come in and they manage their apartments. So there's a lot of that in the Cinque Terre and that's just modern kind of commerce. So um, things change. Uh, people don't uh, work their fields anymore. A lot of the vineyards are going um, wild uh, because the kids don't want to work in the, in, the, in the vineyards for almost no money, uh, which is understandable. Uh, but the charm, I've been going back for 40 years, and every time I go back, I wonder, how is it changing? And you know, I love it as much now as I did 40 years ago. It is an amazing place. It's no longer the humble poor place it used to be, but it's an amazing place. And uh, I've just been eating a poor excuse for Cinque Terre cuisine here, and it just makes me want to get on an airplane and go back there and do it right. <laughs> Except for my biscotti and my uh, Vinsanto. I'm doing this one really good. Okay. Uh, in consideration of how it's changed, Rick, James is curious if you feel like um, your promotion of the Cinque Terre has contributed to the over-tourism issues that some parts of Italy are facing. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, I haven't contributed to the over-tourism of Florence or Rome, noticeably, but I've certainly contributed to the places I've dis discovered, like the Cinque Terre. I was in, uh, I, I told you, I, I know the weave of these towns. A couple years ago, I was in Vernazza, hanging out really late. And one man is the troubadour of the town and he sings folk songs that he writes. And he played one of his folk songs and I'm in it. I'm in a folk song for that town. Rick Steves, the travel guy that came here as a young backpacker in 1976. And now half of the hotels are filled by people carrying his book. I mean, I don't know Italian enough to know what his words are, but it was probably something like that. So have I ruined it? Well, I've contributed to its evolution from a humble town with no international cuisine um, commerce to a very thriving tourist destination. People now wear t-shirts that says Rome, Florence, Venice, Cinque Terre. You know, it's just, it's on the map. Um, uh, what do the locals think? When I go there, the locals are very thankful. I mean, I'm, I'm, there's nowhere in Europe where I'm not more royally welcome than the Cinque Terre. Even if people aren't in my book, they appreciate what I've done there for their economy. Um, how about the tourists? Are they upset with me? Well, every once in a while, somebody says, you shouldn't have ruined the Cinque Terre. You should have just told me so I could go there and enjoy it alone. Well, I'm sorry, it doesn't work that way. My job, I'm the hired hand of the traveling American public. I find things, I write them up, and then I explain them so you can go there and visit it. But the tourists I meet are having a great time and the locals I meet are happy they're, they're there and I get to be the conduit. So I feel good about what I've, uh, my impact on the Cinque Terre but I also feel a responsibility to find other places for those who want to get away from the crowds. And I feel a big responsibility to go back to the Cinque Terre every time I can and update it where I'm promoting the good ethical mom and pops instead of the aggressive ones that might want to come in for the quick dollar. Uh, switching to a more personal question, Rick, uh, a couple of folks were wondering why you put your backpack over one shoulder. Uh, do you ever put it over both shoulders? Is there a reason? I'm not sure. Um, I've got it right here. I don't go anywhere without my Chibi Today bag. <laughs> and uh, I put it over one shoulder. Um, when I'm filming, 
I need something to do with my hands. I'm, ner I'm full of nervous energy and bothers Simon. It's just distracting. So he says, hang on to this. Uh, so then you can rein it in, you know. Uh, so that helps me. Also, I don't like to skimp on what I need, my essentials. And I want to have something bigger than a, a pocket to put this in. So here, I've got my sweater, my camera, extra gear for the TV shoot, uh, you know, whatever I need in here. I, I want to have that capacity. But I don't want to wear it like a backpack because to me it's a different kind of presence. I, it's a shoulder bag. So I could get a shoulder bag, but I just like this two strap TV today bag because for me it's flexible. Long worded answer for, I don't know, that's just how I do it. I'm probably bent because I've spent 100 days a year with it on this shoulder. But I've spent five years wearing a sousaphone on this shoulder. So maybe it's just straightening me out. All right, Rick, we have time for one final question. It comes from Curtis, who asks, why is Italy your favorite country in Europe? Well, India is my favorite country anywhere. So why is that? Because it wallops my ethnocentricity. It rearranges all my cultural furniture. It humbles me. I, I just, it's, it's like going to a different world. And the closest thing in, in, in Europe to India in that regard, I think is Italy. Italy challenges you. It makes you be patient. It makes you celebrate chaos. It makes you get over this and that little bump in the road. Uh, I love the food. I love the people. I love the history and the art. Um, I love the hill towns. Uh, I, I, I love the chaos, bella chaos. I need, I need efficiency. I would live nowhere else but right here in the United States to run my business, I'll tell you that. But when I go for a fun vacation, mm, just watching the show makes me want to go back to Italy. So I don't know, uh, the, the, if a person likes Italy, that's my mark of a good traveler. If somebody doesn't like Italy, I don't, I'm not bold enough to tell them, I think that's a sign of a lousy traveler. But if you don't like Italy, you should probably go to Denmark. You know, I mean, for a lot of people, there's Italy is just traffic jams, people ripping you off, people crowding in line, body odor, stray hairs, temper tantrums, traffic jams. You know, if you don't like that, go to Denmark. I mean, Denmark is perfect. It's heaven. But if you like that package deal that is Italy, the Bella Chaos, you got to take it in stride. I mean, it is a package deal. You don't get some of it without the other. You can try up in the north. The Germanic part of Italy has a lot of the good stuff, Italy, with the German efficiency. But no, Italy is a package deal. And if you like Italy, it gets better as far as you go south. It gets more intense. I always say, if you like Italy as far as Rome, go farther south because it gets better. If it's getting on your nerves by the time you get down to Rome, don't go further south because it gets worse. Okay, Italy intensifies as you plunge deeper. But you got to do Italy. It's one area that really benefits from having a tour guide. I'll tell you that for me, for my TV shoots and for people on tour. That's why our best selling tours are Italy. Uh, uh, our Italy tour program is just thriving. I'm so proud of it. Hey, this has been so much fun. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. I want to, um, I just want to, um, I feel like we've gone through a lot as a country and it's nice to have an hour where we just can relax and dream about travels again, but we're at a, we're at a, 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 a threshold right now where it's a new beginning. We're going to conquer this pandemic. We're going to come together as a nation. We're going to embrace government as a tool for our communities so we can work together. It's a beautiful thing. I'm so filled with hope right now. And I'm so thankful that I've traveled because it helps me to come home and appreciate how richly blessed we are to live right here and how much we owe to this country and how much we should work really hard as citizens to make it a better place. So with that, I wanna wish you happy travels, even if we're just staying home for a little while and we'll hope to see you every Monday as we travel together. Thanks a lot, ciao.